This is an introduction to English grammar part six, nouns and noun phrase roles, subjects and complements. This is for a course given at the University of Utah and my name is Karen. The main points for this presentation is that noun phrases can act as subjects, objects, and complements. In fact, for this presentation, we're just gonna focus on subjects and complements and there's a separate presentation for objects. A general prescriptive rule is to be concise. Subject is a grammatical definition and not related to meaning. We'll look at several examples of that. The canonical word order for English is subject, verb, object. Okay, these are kind of the important points for you to see before we get started. Terms important for today are subject, complement, expletive, copula, and elliptical. Noun phrase roles. Noun phrases happen in several possible roles or functions in the sentence. Your book mentions the following, subject, complement, direct object, indirect object, and object of a preposition. Again, we'll just be looking at subject and complement during this presentation. The goals is that I want you to be able to identify the subject of a sentence. We'll look at several examples. Also, students should be able to list the times when subjects are harder to identify. So some sentences are easy, some sentences are more difficult. Students should also be able to find a complement and its linking verb, okay? Hint, complements have linking verbs, okay? Subject. The subject of the sentence often, but not always, comes at the beginning of the sentence. In general, the subject is the thing that is doing the verb or does the action in the sentence. The subject agrees with the verb in number and person. So here's an example. Karen likes teaching grammar at the University of Utah. Karen is the subject of the sentence. Uh, the verb is likes teaching and it agrees. We wouldn't say Karen like teaching. So it has to agree with third person in this case. Here's another example. English grammar is a difficult topic for many students. Okay? If it didn't agree with the verb, we could say something like, English grammar are a difficult topic for many students. That would be ungrammatical in English. The students in this grammar class are doing very well so far. Subjects that are harder to identify. In a passive construction, which we'll look at in a later chapter, the actor is not the subject, but rather the recipient of the action. So the students in this class are encouraged to notice grammar examples in everyday life. So the students, the instructor is doing the encouraging, right? I said that the subject does the verb. Well, the instructor is actually doing the encouraging um, in this case because the sentence is switched, switched to a passive construction. But even though the instructor is doing the action, the students in the class is still the subject because it, com because it comes at the beginning of the sentence and it agrees with the verb. Okay, so a subject is a grammatical description and it is not related, it is not related to the meaning of the word itself. Here are some other subjects that are harder to identify. Canonical English word order is subject, verb, object. So we already talked about subjects being at the beginning. This means that the subject almost always comes near the beginning of the clause. However, word order is sometimes changed with the position of the subject. My friend wants to be a great actress, but Julia Roberts, she ain't. So in the first clause, my friend wants to be a great actress. It's in its normal position at the beginning. But at the end, where we talk about her and compare her to Julia Roberts, she is still the subject of the clause, but it doesn't come near the beginning of the clause because for a fact, we're trying to identify um, it in a different way. Rarely do I see a lily without thinking of my grandmother. Okay, here before, I could have just said, I rarely see a lily, um, but for effect, I want to say rarely do I see a lily. So I is still the subject, but it doesn't come right at the beginning of the sentence. We also have ellipt elliptical subjects or ellipses. Imperative or command forms in English typically have a hidden subject. So if I say something to you like, remember to do your homework, there isn't a subject that I can see. If you can't hear the subject, is it still there? Ha ha ha. You remember to do your homework. 
Okay, so here we have a missing subject when we use an imperative. Remember to do your homework. But the subject of the sentence, even though it is not expressed, we learned about ellipses uh, when we talked about leaving off the ends of sentences with John is taller than I. But in this case, the ellipse is the subject of the sentence. In questions, the word order frequently is dif different from the regular word order of subject, verb, object. When we form a question, something like, what did you eat last night, we move the subject and the verb. Okay? Did you really eat a whole pie? So you is the subject of the sentence. You ate a whole pie. But when we ask it in a question form, we move the verb to the beginning. Now, I'm not going to stress about how we form questions right now because we have a whole chapter on question formation and using questions. But it is important for you to recognize that sometimes the subject does not come at the beginning of the sentence. Okay? Is there any pie left? Some questions, though, can preserve this subject, verb, object order. Uh, we call these um, echo questions. So something like, you went to the hospital? I use question intonation, but I use a declarative word order. We also can have an expletive subject. What are the subjects of the following sentences? There are more than 30 students in the class. It's going to rain tomorrow. It snows every winter. Is there any pie left? When we look at these sentences, it's a little bit harder to identify what the subject is. Okay, here we go. Sentences like these have subjects with no meaning. It's kind of a space filler in English because English requires that we always have a subject for a sentence to be grammatical. So it's kind of a space filler with no meaning. It's going to rain tomorrow or there are more than 30 students in the class. From your textbook, look at these sentences. Okay? How do you know if they have placeholder subjects? And can any of them be interpreted in two different ways? This is where I left my purse, or excuse me, there is where I left my purse. It is snowing. There is an excuse for his tardiness. It is in the closet. It's too hot to eat. Let's look at it's too hot to eat for just a second. Um, it is too hot to eat. It could go either way. So sometimes when I'm talking about the temperature outside and say, oh, it's just too hot to eat, now it's acting as an expletive where it's just filling a space. But if I'm pointing to my bowl or I eat something and say, oh, it it is too hot to eat. Now I'm using it in the non-human third person, where instead of saying he or she, I'm now using it as the third person marker. Uh, let's look at there is an excuse for his tardiness. It can be kind of an existential sentence. Uh, there is some sort of excuse for his tardiness. I just don't know what it is. Or it could be me handing a piece of paper to the teacher saying, there is an excuse for his tardiness. And so there are some instances where it can be interpreted in two ways. Let's look at the prescription about ex expletive subjects. Style guides discourage students from using these type of constructions because the general prescriptive rule is to be concise. It, when we use sentences like this where we have words that have no meaning, we're becoming unnecessarily wordy. However, they are so common for use and they're so handy for introducing new topics that many professors do not have a problem with them anymore. So this is a case where I would check with a professor, a, a professor who you're writing a paper for, before you make the decision of which way to go on that to find out if they're acceptable or not. Prescriptive rules require that the verb agree with the other noun phrase in the sentence. So here we have an expletive subject where we have there are three cats in my backyard. R should agree with the three cats, not with the subject of the sentence. There is a very interesting program on television tonight. In contemporary English, we often get this contraction, theirs, which has become, it has become either singular or plural complements. So something like, um, we can't combine there are three cats in my backyard, but we can 
combine there is a very interesting program to there is a very interesting program. However, it's become very common in English for us to also say there's three cats in my backyard and for that to mean there are. Okay? That is prescriptively incorrect even though we use that a lot in our in our English speech and so it seems to be fine with our English mental grammar. There's another cool program on TV tomorrow night. There's four cats at my neighbor's house. Let's talk a little bit more about subjects. Sometimes grammar books define subject of the sentence as what the sentence is about. There's an inadequacy though with this type of definition. Here's a sentence. The librarian found the book the student was looking for. What is the problem with saying it's the thing the sentence is about? Okay. Subject is a grammatical term not related to meaning. So when we look at this, the librarian found the book the student was looking for, there are really a couple of different things it's about. Is it about the librarian herself finding the book? Or is it more about the student looking for a book? Or is it finding the book the student was looking for? Is it finding something the student was looking for? Or is it about the book specifically? So here subject is just a grammatical term, right? That thing that agrees with the verb and comes at the beginning of the sentence. Also from your textbook, it is very common in casual conversation for people to say things like this. My sister, she gets all the breaks. This is called a double subject and is considered non-standard in formal writing. Can you think of any useful purpose it might serve in conversation? Why might we want to do this kind of a uh, uh, construction. Okay? And it might interest you to know that such constructions are considered standard in many languages. So even though we don't consider it standard, many other world languages use this type of a construction where they double that subject. The subject is often near the beginning of the sentence, especially in the canonical word order subject verb object sentence. So that's our regular sentence structure. Subject is a description of gra grammatical position, not a statement on meaning. And some subjects are potentially confusi confusing, especially subjects in passive sentences, elliptical subjects, like in imperatives, subjects in questions, and expletive subjects. Also important for you to know that English has a subject, verb, object, word order, but many other languages have a different word order. Let's talk a little bit about compliments. The general meaning of a compliment, spelled with two E's and no I's, is that it's something that fits together or makes something complete. If you think back to your math days when you're looking at angles and what are complementary angles, well, it's an angle that makes something complete to a certain point, to a certain degree. Compliments, particularly subject compliments, Complement is a grammatical distinction associated with a copula verb. Okay, what's a copula verb? Well, a copula verb joins two parts of the sentence together without adding any action. So we have no verbal meaning going on here. In English, the copula verb is be. Karen is the instructor, instructor of the introduction to grammar class. My parents are excellent musicians and your friends were happy during the party last night. Uh, so to be, the be form of the verb varies because it has to agree with the subject and it also has to agree for tense, which we'll talk about next chapter. But it basically is just joining the information at the beginning of the sentence, the subject, with the information at the end, its complement. So how do we know if it's a copula verb? Be doesn't always act like a copula verb. One test for a copula is to try to reverse the parts of the sentence and see if the meaning is generally preserved. Karen is the instructor of the Introduction to English Grammar class. Or we could switch it. The instructor of the Introduction to English Grammar class is Karen. Uh, yeah, I think that the meaning is generally preserved there. How about here? The students in class are having a great time with grammar. The uh, second sentence, when we reverse it, having a great time with grammar is or are the students in the class. Mm, that doesn't seem to be grammatical to me, so I marked that with an asterisk. So it seems like in the first group of sentences, it is a copula verb, and in the second, in the second sentences, it's not. 
many languages don't have copula verbs at all. And Spanish, sorry, Spanish has more than one copula verb. Let's take a look at the subject complement. It's the portion of the subject that is not, it's the portion of the clause that is not the subject. So we have Karen, the subject, and we have the verb is, and then the subject complement is the rest of the information, the instructor of the introduction to English grammar class. That's our subject complement. I also like to refer to this as a subject complement gives us more information about the subject. It complements by adding additional information. In old-fashioned grammar lingo, this is sometimes called a predicate nominative or a predicate adjective, depending on what it looks like, whether it looks like a noun or looks like an adjective. Guess what? We have some prescriptions or rules about using a copula verb. Prescriptivists don't like them. They don't want you to use the word be too much. It's better to use a verb that has more action. So for example, prescriptivists would like you to change this sentence, Karen is the instructor of the Introduction to English Grammar course, to Karen instructs the Introduction to English Grammar class. For me, um, I'm fine with the sentences either way, but there are rules saying we shouldn't use be too much, that our sentences should be more active. There are a few other verbs that are considered to take subject complements. They're a very limited set and they're called linking verbs. Okay? A linking verb links the subject with its complement. So here are some examples. James feels sad sometimes. Harry seems a complicated man. She looks tired. It's possible that look can be both a linking verb and an action verb. She looked at the book is an action verb, but she looks tired seems to just give us information about her, not any action. James feels sad sometimes. Unless James has a cat whose name is sad, this one is definitely a linking verb. But it could be an action verb if his cat whose name is sad is some, someone that James is feeling the fur on.